Bill Boggs here. Welcome to Midday. This is a very exciting day for me and uh, for the folks in our audience. I think it would be a fair assumption to say that we have a few fans of the great uh, television series Star Trek with us today. Is that not correct? Yeah. yeah. Um, what we're going to do in midday today is look into the future, not just the future as portrayed on television and science fiction, but the future as it connects to what the potential reality could be. Now, we have with us later in the show Mr. Ben Bova. You know Ben Bova, right? He is a gentleman who is a noted uh, science fiction writer. He is the executive editor of the terrific new Omni. It's not so new anymore, but Omni magazine is reasonably new. So with Ben Bova, we're going to talk about what life could be like in the future and what some of the things on Star Trek that we think of as science fiction, how long might it be before some of those things become a reality in our lives? But the first part of our show today, we're going to meet a gentleman who is truly created one of the all-time great characters in the history of American entertainment. I'm talking about William Shatner. Uh, when you think about the Star Trek series, you're talking about a television series that was on the air for three years. It went off the air in 1969. Uh, it's been 10 years and the fans would, fans like the people in the audience today, would simply not let this show die. So now we are confronted with Star Trek the motion picture. And we are happy to have with us a gentleman, I want to tell you more of his credits than simply Star Trek, which I happen to have in my pocket. We know that William Shatner portrayed Captain James Kirk in the popular TV series Star Trek. He is now Admiral in the motion picture. Uh, also, he starred in his own, another television series called Barbary Coast. He was in the PBS drama, drama Andersonville, starred in the film Kingdom of the Spiders. He was on Broadway here as a lead in the world of Susie Wong. In addition, he co-starred with Julie Harris in A Shot in the Dark. He certainly is going to get a lot of love from the folks in the audience. We're going to talk to him about Star Trek, the motion picture. Here is William Shatner. Join us. As you were. Wait a minute, I say that. <laughs> You're right, Admiral. Here, let me help you with this, sir. No, I can do this. All right. This is maybe your show, but I've plucked on a lavalier in my time. There you go. Nice to have you with us. Nice, and as nice I said to you before the show, I really wish you the, the best of success with uh, Star Trek, the motion picture. Thank you, Bill. Um, first thing I want to do is go back a little bit. We, you probably heard my introduction, Star Trek. You can the, do it again if you want. You like that. <laughs> the, uh, the television series. What was there about television back in the days of the late 60s that led to the cancellation of an obviously enduring hit like Star Trek? Oh, well, it wasn't obviously enduring. I At think the time? No, no uh, we, um, if I recall correctly, and, and I'm sure many of these people will be able to answer more clearly than I, uh, it was moved around in the three years that we were on. Time slot Time wise, slots. Yeah. And our final time slot was uh, Friday at 10 o'clock in the evening. And I don't... You probably weren't home then to watch it. <laughs> Who was home at Friday 10 o'clock to watch? That's yeah. it, exactly. It's a graveyard slot, isn't it? So I think that uh, we were, our demise was hastened by our slotting. Well, how do you feel about the fact that the fans kept it alive and about the, I mean, it's been 10 years. You've gone on to do other things. You did yeah. other things before I this. was going to say, uh, uh, that was such a meager list of, uh, of <laughs> credits. It sounds like every so often. <laughs> yes. And then he took four <laughs> years off and rested. And in the fifth year, well, there were some of them. I know you've done more you know, than that, just, but we had to get sounds, on with the show. I know, but I mean, it sounds so awful. Like, I, well, is that all I did? Wow. I, uh, well, I, yes, I was gainfully employed for a number of years uh, subsequent to that. What was your question? Well, I was just curious about your emotional reaction to the people we have with us. The fact that, that you've created something that uh, was good work when you did it and that enough people of enough different generations have seen the value of your work and, and the work of the writers and the technicians and the other actors. And people like this, are your, who are your fans, have really kept the thing alive and really, I think, are responsible for the fact that we've got a huge motion picture being released this weekend. How do you feel about them? How do I feel about them? Yeah. There they are. <laughs> oh, there they are. Um, they're wonderful. They are the greatest. I, I've watched uh, fandom on other personalities. I've looked with great curiosity at how other people who have a following, yeah. uh, what, the, what it's like. And uh, I don't think that anybody in the public eye has 
the kind of people who like me and us. There's a, there's a real genuine caring, yeah. there's a genuine love, there's a, it, it, it lacks the hysteria of, uh, of that kind of momentary thing. These people have been fans of Star Trek and perhaps fans of mine for years. Why is it though? That's what I'm trying to figure. Because they're terrific. But they see something there, there's something there in Star Trek. Is it the fact that it exists on so many levels, it's good for kids? Why, good for are you asking me why do they like Star Trek? Yeah, what is there about it? Bill, you know? I am totally mystified. <laughs> good answer. But I can give you some All right, yeah. potential uh, answers to that. And then I think what would be interesting is if to hear now them, or later yeah. to hear what their reasons are because it's, it, I'm, I'm, I really, I'm, I said it joking here, but I, I really am. I'm, I'm, I'm kind of, I never quite understand it. Some people like the science fiction aspects yeah. of it. You know, the guy, uh, Mr. Uh, uh, Bova. Bova ben from, Bova. Uh, from uh, Omni. Om Omni would like the science fiction aspects of it. I almost call him Mr. Omni from Bova. You know? <laughs> uh, nice to have his own magazine. Uh, uh, and, and then some people like the action and adventure, the, 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 the adventure story. Mm -hmm. There was a philosophical overtone to yeah, many sure. of the shows. Um, science fiction by its very nature says that the future itself will exist and that sense of hope that we won't be obliterated tomorrow is, uh, is a, a yeah. factor. Well, I, one of the factors... The family... Of, uh, I, have a, I have one more and then I have my possible solution. All right. Uh, the family of players, that, uh, the group of people that they learn to, to like and anticipate what they would do. And all of, all of them are back for the motion picture. Every, every single one of them. That's great. That's amazing. And none of that, I think, explains why uh, Star Trek was, it, uh, w w was the way it was. And the only thing I come up with is the mystique of what a hit is in the first place. What makes yeah. a hit play? What hit makes a hit movie? We really don't know because if the makers of that hit movie, hit play, could analyze it and, and say it's three drops of yeah. talent and four drops of writing, they would make that same formula and come out with a, a, a hit movie every, as, as, as frequently as they could just turn the cameras. But that isn't the there case. There are no experts, really. When you find it, the the, the, the final public, analysis is chemistry. Yeah. Chemistry is what I think. All right, I, I think that we should... Uh, are you ready to see the very first sample look at the Star Trek, the motion picture? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> well, we're not going to show it to you. <laughs> No, we're going to do it. Uh, would you like to? Would you like to, as we say in the talk show business, set up this clip? You mean just yeah. <laughs> tell us? Tell us a little bit about what we're going to see. Um, I'm not quite sure what you're going to see, but if it's, I tell you, I haven't seen the motion. They give it the general. I, 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 Bill, I haven't seen the motion. Picture. I understand. As we sit here right now, they're still making the prints. There's a guy from weekend. Paramount running it around. With the, That's right. The thing they're on. still. I got it. I got it. He's saying, I've got, I've got it right here. Here's real 17, right here. Okay. That's, that's what's happening. That's true. Nobody has seen it. And it's coming to the theaters as, you know... At the Wet, probably. Well, yes. the distributor is saying, do I give them back their buck or do I keep it? And then the, the, yep. the film arrives. It opens this weekend, and uh, I was talking to the fellow from Paramount, uh, and it is not yet totally printed. That's quick. That is quick. Well, uh, so uh, I, I don't uh, know uh, what else we can say then about it, except roll it and we'll take a look at okay, it. Okay, and then I'll explain it as it happens. If this is the clip I think it is, part, yeah. there's one clip with two pieces in it. If it's the first piece, I think it is me <laughs> taking over the ship. Let's look. <laughs> Star Trek, the motion picture. I'm taking over the center seat. You're what? I'm replacing you as captain of the Enterprise. You'll stay on as executive officer. Temporary grade reduction to commander. You personally are assuming command? Yeah. May I ask why? My experience. Five years out there dealing with unknowns like this. My familiarity with the Enterprise, it's cruel. Admiral, this is an almost totally new Enterprise. You don't know her a tenth as well as I do. That's why you're staying aboard. I'm sorry, Will. No, Admiral. I don't think you're sorry. Not one damn bit. I remember when you recommended me for this command. You told me how envious you were and how much you hoped you'd find a way to get a Starship command again. Well, sir, it looks like you found a way. Report to the bridge. 
Commander. Immediately. Aye, sir. All right. Oh, oh, oh. Doesn't that make you feel good? Star Trek is back, and we'll be back right after this. Our guest, as you know, is William Shatner. Let's talk about Star Trek, the motion picture. Now, it's been 10 years since Star Trek went off the air. Uh, but what is the time frame that has passed between the end of the series and the opening of the movie in the lives of yourself and Mr. Spock and so forth? It's never really spelled out, but we figure about five. Five years. Mm -hmm. Okay. And how has your character changed? Five years is a long time. I mean, I've changed a lot in five years personally. You probably have. What about C Captain and now Admiral Kirk? What's happened to him in five years? By the way, Admiral Kirk is there, but when he takes over the, the captaincy of the ship, he becomes the, the captain, captain again. Now. How has he changed? Uh, well, he's changed. I, I, I think he's a little more driven, a little more anxious about his, his powers. Well, what has he been doing for the five, the five years? Driving and being anxious. Driving? <laughs> <laughs> Stopping well, off at the, the right. McDonald's in outer really, space. Right? Driving a little bit. Um, I, uh, I don't know what he's been doing. He's been working his way up the ladder of the, of the service. The ser for the, feder the Federation. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> and, uh, and that's what he's been doing. Now, go ahead. But, uh, so you asked me how he's different. How is he different? Yeah. Well, uh, that I think he's, he's, he's a little more anxious about what he can do and, and, and driven, perhaps. But essentially, he's different in the way that I'm different. Uh, ten years is a long time, and just from the passage of ten years, you look at life uh, a little differently. You're uh, a little more aware of your own mortality. You're a little more concerned about the quality of your life. I am a different, quite a different person than I was ten years ago. Uh, my life has changed considerably. Uh, Can you quickly tell us about that? I mean, I know it's a decade. But well, I'd like in about a that's minute. That's quite a question. <laughs> <laughs> no, is there one thing you can say you care less about success, you care more about success, you're more into your family? I, no, I, I, I care about success, but the definition of success perhaps has ah, changed. Yeah, more yeah. inner peace, probably. I think perhaps yeah. that might be it. Um, so I think, now, having played the series as close to myself because of the exigencies of time and pressure on a series, you don't have time to pretend you're something you're not, mm -hmm. you are what you are. You have to play it that way. Most series leads, all series leads, are what they are on the air. That's what they are really like. Uh, because you're too tired, you're too fatigued to do anything else. So Captain Kirk was pretty much myself. In the movie, I had to go back and watch old segments to find out what I had done, you know, when, I, when, I, when the movie was imminent. And uh, I just played him again, close to myself. Now, Captain Kirk, as I've been doing a little research for the show, in a way, was based, when Roddenberry, the creator of Star Trek, based when he went to the Roddenberry, networks. the creator. It sounds like uh, <laughs> the creator. God. Uh, actually, I, I want to get so much in. That's really why I'm talking so fast at this point. But what I wanted to get to was that he compared your character to Horatio Hornblower, the great English sailor in the 19th century. He also compared Star Trek to sort of wagon train in outer space. So. That really what I'm getting at is that, that the character you play is a man of ultimate and final authority. And I'd like you to talk about that a little bit in terms of that, which means that you're the ultimate hero and that you really can't make many mistakes as I Captain Kirk. I spent some time uh, when I was doing some work for the Navy um, with atomic submarine commanders. The guys who go out on patrol for six months and uh, are linked in, uh, are in really this, on their own. The, they're yeah. on their own. Yeah. They are linked with uh, by radio or, or whatever means of communication they have with the mainland. But they're really autonomous. And this captain uh, of an atomic submarine is very much like the captains of the sailing ships of old when they couldn't get yeah. back to, to to command, and they had very much a responsibility. But in addition to that. Commanders of those kinds of vessels, perhaps all commanders, but I, I can verify uh, uh, the atomic submarine ones. In these close quarters, and alone for six months with no one else but the crew, have to keep the crew at some arm's length. As much as they would like to say, I'm in pain, I need help, I want 
I want somebody to, yeah. to say hello to, that, you know, I, I have to tell somebody something. He must keep these real men, must keep them at arm's length in case the time ever comes when he says, press the button and launch that Polaris. They have to do and it. And the guy can't say, well, say, hey, George, you don't, you don't really want me to press the button. <laughs> hey, you know. that's, I that's said, press the nuke, button. George. Yeah, right. <laughs> right. Yeah. And it can't be a George. Uh, it yeah, got, it's it got to be, be Captain. And, and, it's got to exactly. it is, yeah. and so there's this arm length thing. Well, imagine going out for years in this kind of thing, as they did in the sailing ships of old. Sure. So I was aware of all this, and, and that ultimate authority is an awesome thing. It's also a very lonely thing, the loneliness, loneliness of command. Does the Captain Kirk part, has, rather, the Captain Kirk part of your brain thought about what's happening in Iran? I've thought a great deal about what's happening. And what does the Captain Kirk part of your brain think about that situation? What might Captain Kirk be doing that might That's be That's a wild question, and I'll tell you exactly what I think I should, should do. What I think should be done is what's being done. That only by quiet diplomacy are we going to have any effect. We have all the power in the world. There's no question about that. We it's could stupid. literally erase the Ayatollah if we wanted to. Uh, I mean, it's, we uh, could kill yeah. everybody yeah. in Iran and, and not uh, uh, suffer any, any ill effects ourselves, except for the remorse of that kind of incredible action. But by quiet diplomacy, by letting things go for a while, these emotions will pass. I was in Iran. I did some photography uh, looking for a, a leopard in the mountains of Iran, and I, I was there. I was among the, uh, uh, the, the people in Iran. When uh, was that, Bill? Uh, about two, three years ago. Uh -huh. uh, it's an extraordinary country. It's a country of deep emotion. It's a primitive country. Most of those people are illiterate. Uh, it's a country with a great tradition of Persian. And I, I studied uh, Alexander the Great and his campaigns in Persia. And, and uh, there's a great uh, history there. There are proud people. And I see that you respect and this. And, they're yeah. passionate people, and they're a bargaining people. There are people, I went to buy a rug, literally, and bargained one third the price down with the help of another uh, Iranian. They are all these things. and. It, if we're going to get anything out, if we're going to get out of this situation with our people uh, alive, it's got to be done with quiet diplomacy. That is your answer, and that is also, I think, Captain Kirk's answer. That would be, I okay. think. Let me move on to the, the concept of the change over from the, the television series. What basically can you do in Star Trek, the motion picture, that you really couldn't do in Star Trek, the TV series? A, uh, you mean as an actor? Or no, no, no. I mean as a, as, as a film. What can you do oh, with the movies? Special wow. effects? Oh, yeah. The story... Nudity? Uh, <laughs> a bald head. <laughs> <laughs> the uh, story is good, solid, uh, yeah. mm -mm, tasty uh, uh, Star Trek. You'll like it. But the special effects are incredible. Mm -hmm. Imagine Doug Trumbull. Oh, wow. Imagine John Dykstra That's on the same show. I mean, it's... It's, it's okay to applaud. I mean, you know who the, he's talking about. I, and, excuse me a second. I hate it when I look and I see the audience going... Ah! Ah! Go, ahead. Go ahead. Excuse me. <laughs> well, those two geniuses of special effects, the greatest artists in the, in the, in the industry, are working on the same movie. I mean, it's incomprehensible. And there they are applying their trade, doing their wonderful things. And that's things. going to be Star Trek. And that's going to add the dimension to the, the huge picture that... Uh... Now, I'm going to ask you a question. Now, this, is from, this question is from deep in the heart of fandom. I thought you would say the, Texas. No, the fandom. <laughs> there are those Star Trek fans who have intimated a homosexual, potential homosexual relationship between... Not us. <laughs> oh, no. Between Captain Kirk and Mr. Spock portrayed by Leonard Nimoy. So much to the, the, the effect that uh, Gene Roddenberry, in the novelization of Star Trek The Motion Picture, puts an editor's note around the word that uh, Spock uses, uh -huh. which I think is Tyla or no, something no. like that. Tyla. What is it? Tyla. Which could mean <laughs> lover or something like that. Why, this, my question is, why do you think some fans see this potential relationship between Kirk and Spock? Let's have the straight talk Because they're gay. <laughs> Well, that's it. But that's believe the me, reason. Now you've heard it on this show. Me, I've had to educate Leonard. <laughs> <laughs> Don't be ridiculous. I wasn't. I'm saying this is from fans. I know. Well, that, but, but a beautiful girl is. I mean, that's fantastic, isn't it? I mean. I've always thought so, yeah, but well, I'm just, this, but the fans, why do you think some fans saw it that way? Is well, it just all is because, illusion? No, I mean, because 
a friendship between two men yeah. is so uh, uh, strange to American audiences. Yeah. You know, I mean, uh, men and women in Europe, for example, walk arm in arm. They're close friends. They walk arm. Hey, what do you think about them? Well, I don't know. And they're holding you each other. You and I do that down Fifth Avenue. We're, we're going to hit every column in the world. Uh, well, you know, a different it's true, though. midday show, you know. Yeah, mid, Midlife show. So, so you think that's just part of their <laughs> reading something into it? There's no, there's no evidence in the script or in your performances that supports that. Well, none in hand. None in hand. <laughs> All right. How has the women's movement affected this? What about nurse? What's her name? Nurse? Chapel. Chapel. How is she different in uh, Star Trek The Motion Picture? Well, not, not, too, not too different. Not I too am. different? Not too different. The women's movement, you know what you're talking about. I have a book coming out uh, called Shatner. Do we have where, it here? We're No Man. Throw it over. How did you get it? <laughs> Here's a man. Don't. Harriet. All right. <laughs> where did you get it? Brentano's in Queens. Hey, Brentano's. <laughs> when now, the fan has the book before the author. That, that's a, that's a I got my a copy fan. yesterday. Here's the book. Listen. Now, what you're talking about, about the concepts of femininity and masculinity, are dealt with in that book in some way. I mean, uh, hopefully in a, in a more uh, detailed way than we can on the air. But the concepts of masculinity, for example, you, which, we, which we were just talking about. Men don't cry was the rule, was the thing that we were all brought up with. Right. But Star Trek, and perhaps myself, had something to do with trying to change that. Men can cry and still be masculine. Why can't you fight as hard and still be moved to tears by something? Did Captain Kirk ever cry on Star oh, Trek? Oh, certainly, absolutely. Yeah. Um, sometimes when I saw the show. Uh, <laughs> like I said, particularly in 1969, after it was canceled. <laughs> right. Good time to cry. And, and that has to do with the uh, with, uh, concept of femininity. My wife writes a chapter there about the concept of femininity, the chameleon effect we talk about, how women are brought up to change their way of feeling, to suit the person they're with. They could change their skins. How do you want me to feel? Then that's the way I feel. You want me to cry and be feminine? That's the way I feel. Huh. The chameleon effect we talk about. And those are some of the aspects that we discuss in the book that are suggested by Star Trek. Well, I'm looking forward to reading this. It's called Shatner, and it's uh, available from Ace Books. Now, Ace? Ace. Uh, or is it uh, Tempo? Well, this is an Ace book. As a matter of fact, is this is a book. fake cover. This is my biography. <laughs> We'll take a break. When you look in that camera and say something to the folks who couldn't be in the audience who, from Captain Kirk directly. Sorry, you lucked out. <laughs> I feel, I, I'm, really, I'm a very happy man to be able to wade into a group of Star Trek uh, fans and have them have the opportunity to ask questions of William Shatner. First, I want to ask one of you, what is the difference? St would you stand up, please? <laughs> it's all right. Jeez, I'm not asking you to go into outer space okay. for 20 years. What is the difference between a Trekker and a Trekkie? Because we hear that term Trekkie, and what does it mean? Okay, a Trekkie is somebody who has, uh, who's a groupie, in effect. One of the people who will run around at conventions with antennae and blue skin and attack the stars who have come to be with us. Uh, a Trekker is somebody a little bit more serious who um, is into other parts of fandom besides just the conventions. The so you're a Trekkie? No, I'm a <laughs> I Trekker, I hope. You're a Trekker. Right. You want to ask a question? I do have one question, and I don't know if uh, Mr. Chat would be willing to answer it or not. Um, in Roddenberry's novelization, um, let me rephrase that. Is the ending of Roddenberry's novelization the final ending that was used in the movie? I haven't read uh, Gene's ending. Uh, I haven't read the book at all. Uh -huh. I, I got the press kit myself uh, a while ago, and I've been so busy, I really haven't had a chance to read it. From what I gather, it seems to have been an older version of the script uh, prior to its cuts and uh, manipulations by the various people who came in contact with the script. So I can't tell you what the ending of the uh, book is, but if you know what the ending is, we've been trying to keep the ending uh, a secret uh, until the movie is out so that people won't be disappointed. I think won't be, uh, the you. ending won't be pulled out from underneath. Another question. Where, where do we, ha you had one, right? Would you stand up, please? What's your name? Carolyn. Okay, what would you like to ask? Um, well, I'm actually asking this question for another member of the audience who was too chicken. <laughs> Will you point to that person now so they can blush? Possibly? I'm doing enough blushing for everyone. All right, go ahead. Don't be, don't be shy. It's all right. Um, Star Trek has had a profound effect on individual lives. And this person was wondering if the, the people involved in the show were aware of that fact, 
of the uh, of the effect that it had on give, give me one or two quick examples of lives you know have been affected in which way by Star Trek I have a friend who was influenced to go on to college and become uh, uh, a physicist uh, because of Star Trek Star Trek's influence I know people who've been on the dating game and done that, but that's, uh, that's, that's all right. No, I'm just kidding. Did you, are you aware of uh, this kind of thing? Very impact, much Bill? so. I'm very much aware. Uh, I have a story, too, perhaps too detailed and complicated to tell you now, uh, that happened in the Vietnam War, and I'll tell it another time, uh, of somebody whose lives were saved uh, by Star Trek. I, I know some of the stories. It's very moving, and, and uh, I feel very touched by it. Thank you. Thank you. Next question. So I'll move over here a little bit. Guy, stand up right on the first row. What's your name? Uh, my name is my name is Dion Hanna. Um, I like social studies a lot, and I was doing research about you know social studies in the '60s, and I think Star Trek came at the right time because um, say the political um, involvement in the Vietnam War, and you know the blacks wanted you know um, you could say relief. Of the pressures, and I was realize um, I was um, I was um, wondering if did you have in Star Trek, you know, some situations that you know are very similar to the Vietnam War, and um, as you could say, what happened with the blacks, not the blacks in particular, but minorities. you know, just minorities of um, America. I think that there was very definitely uh, one show that I can remember uh, uh, very clearly had to do with the Vietnam War, and the. One of the precepts of uh, Star Trek was uh, the, um, the sanctity of diversity, that, that in our very diverseness of color, creed, race, uh, figuration, is the, is the beauty of mankind. Why should we all look exactly the same? How dull, how beautiful it is to look different and appreciate each other's beauty. That's part of what Star Trek tried to say. I want to sneak up here. This will, this will just, a lot of uh, folks brought little surprises and souvenirs that they wanted to see your reaction to. Mm. Here is something for your always, reaction. Always a little apprehensive about one of those. <laughs> <laughs> I remember. Do you remember what that was? Well, it was Mad Comics, wasn't it? Mad Comics did a parody on, on yeah. Star Trek. Yeah. There you are with uh, Dr. Spock. They were for a while. <laughs> I knew, I knew I, I would... He was just to... testing you to see if you were... <laughs> You're still awake. Okay, th what was the name of the fellow who brought that? Craig Morton. Craig Morton, thank you. He throws a pretty good yeah, pass, He throws too. a great pass. <laughs> nice in and out pattern. You had a question, yeah. I'm asking it for my friend. What, what is this? <laughs> it's a combination of Star Trek fans and the, the Shy Club here. Yes. Go ahead. We wanted to know how you felt the first time you, can't, you stepped on board the brand new Enterprise. That's a, <laughs> that's a nice question. Well... Um, the first time that I, uh, that I stepped aboard was the very first shot of the movie. We were all there, very excited, of course, to have come back. Here was this major motion picture with this marvelous director. And the very first shot was me stepping out of the bridge, uh, out of the elevator onto the bridge, and being greeted by a number of the regular cast. It was quite a moving event because the people who worked on Star Trek including the people who built the sets and worked backstage and designed it all, all were either Trekkies or Trekors. <laughs> Some were even Trekettes. Uh, that was uh, t t really unusual because most of the people in the movie business are, who are not involved in front or directly behind the cameras are bored. I mean, you know, they hammer a nail and that's it. And it doesn't matter who the set is for, it's just the nail has to go in there. But all these people were vitally interested and they were all crowded around, all in the sets, to watch this moment happen. And I walked on, the cameras were grinding, and I said, whatever I said. That was the first shot. Interestingly enough, because of the way movies are made, we shot all the bridge stuff, the set. It took a couple of months. And then we went on to other sets and other things. And the last sequence of the movie, six months later, was what preceded that first shot. <laughs> Isn't that wild? Do you understand what I just said? <laughs> we want one more go ahead. <laughs> I just wanted to say that we all love you and we'll see you Thursday night at the premiere. Oh, <laughs> it's going to be exciting. Stand up, please. Hi. Uh, my name is Eve. We came from Rutgers University just to see you today. 
I understand right. most of the students at Rutgers are Star yes. Trek fans, right? Yes, they are. Yes. That's how they got into the school in the first place. <laughs> right. It's a criteria. Yeah. Uh, we'd like to know if uh, Captain Kirk has any romantic involvements in the new movie. I love my ship. <laughs> <laughs> something, something terrible is going to happen to Earth. And guess who are the only people who can stop it? And we take off and we have to deal with this thing that's happening. And there's not really much time for any subplots or any tremendous character development. It's a good adventure straight line story with an ending that I think will uh, be uh, uh, the pro proper resolution of that philosophical story. I think you'll enjoy it, but there isn't the intricate uh, character analysis that uh, you, you might be talking about. Is our guest here? I am in the. Uh, are you a? You're a big Star Trek fan, right? Yes. How many times have you seen each episode? Uh, about 20 times. Each one? Yeah. Well, what do you think about the fact over or the rival station that the episodes are chopped up and, and some scenes you probably even they are, have never they are, seen? They are chopped up, but I know them so well that I just fill in those parts. You, during the commercials, <laughs> you do the dialogue. What yeah. would you like to ask Bill Shatner? Huh? Um, <laughs> from what I understand, it looks like Commodore, uh, Commander Decker would go on to play the captain in a series if it was if there wasn't a new series would you fill that role if the uh, opportunity arose enough for another television series on right. star well, trek i wouldn't want to do it as a series no uh, why is that well because it's debilitating to do a series it's you don't want to do a series uh, that's right okay um but you, you were saying captain decker what looks like com uh, captain decker would go on to play Okay. Oh, yeah, Captain uh, of the Enterprise. No, that, 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 um, if there was another series. That situation is taken care of. Staying in the back, we'll take one more question, then we'll go to the next, uh, take another look at the clip. What's your name? Uh, Conway, Franklin Conway. All right. Uh, do you have Lahura uh, as your communication officer still? She's back. Everybody's yeah. back. And in the same situations, positions that they were in. And if you did it in a new series, something like he was saying, would the same people be playing it other than you? Well, I can't, I can't, uh, I can't answer for them. I don't know. But did at this moment, if the motion picture is really successful, highly successful, I would think that uh, Paramount's tendency would would be to make another motion picture. Uh, <laughs> did most of the people? Did most of the people in Star Trek go on to be greatest stars after Star Trek? Uh, Do I think they will? Yeah. I don't know. You know. Uh, it's all speculation. Yeah. They're Thank certainly you. talented enough. Thank you. Okay. I want to, um, I want to take a look at another clip from uh, Star Trek The Motion Picture, th which opens this weekend. Where is the formal opening? Thursday night in Washington? Thursday night at uh, Big uh, Do in Washington. I don't know exactly what theater. theater. At the McCarthy Theater. And, um, <laughs> And it's uh, a lot of people are important people are being invited, including the cast. Why not? Okay, here's another look. This this uh, clip I think involves Mr. Spock, and uh, let's take a look at Star Trek: The Motion Picture right now. You are the Kirk unit. You will assist me. I've been programmed by Vija to observe and record normal functions of the carbon-based units infesting USS Enterprise. Jim, tricorder. Who is Vija? Vija is that which programmed me. Where is Lieutenant Ilea? That unit no longer functions. I've been given its form to more readily communicate with the carbon-based units infesting Enterprise. Carbon-based units? Humans, Ensign Perez. Us. The plot thickens. It certainly does. Miss Mr. Spock in that one. 
But for a while, Leonard Nimoy really didn't want to do this, did he? He finally caved in, I think, wisely. Otherwise, he would have spent the whole rest of his life explaining why he didn't do it. Actually, what you've just said is why he caved in. Yeah, is Bob, that it? Bob Wisely, I think, was the, uh, <laughs> was the reason. I think that was the reason. Leonard really didn't want to do it again. He wanted again. to put the old ears on. He didn't. Again. Literally and figuratively, they hurt. Literally, putting them on and clipping them to his ears and clipping them, it really, it, he's got scar tissue there. And it was irritating. And he didn't... Irritating, Bill? Yes. Right. <laughs> Well, and tit for tat, you know. <laughs> we could do a number on that. I know. Um, and uh, uh, he didn't want to deal with the identification thing again, too. And he didn't need to. Uh, for, uh, and he was busy on Broadway. Absolutely. So he had a number of things, reasons for not being in it, uh, earnestly and honestly not wanting to be in it. But when the movie became as grand as it did and uh, everybody talked to him and... Uh, Bob Wise himself uh, approached him. Uh, Leonard did change his mind, and thankfully. So what's in the future for you? Beyond perhaps another Star Trek, uh, which oh, would be wonderful yeah. if the motion picture was tremendously successful, as I really sincerely think it will be. Uh, uh, I, what are some of the other things you'd I like to do? I just finished a motion picture uh, called uh, The Kidnapping of the President with Hal Holbrook. It'll be out in the spring. Do you get somewhere. to be the president or the... <laughs> no, Holbrook, because you can't put him in a movie without making him the president. He's right? the president. And yeah. I'm a Secret Service guy who's got to get him out of this terrible jam. Mm -hmm. Sound familiar? Yep. And, um, and now, and then I'm just going to get some rest for the next thing. And then I'm going to just hang on there and take a look at what's happening. Well, I sincerely thank you for coming. I think you've made a lot of your fans and people who are not really into Star Trek. I think they're impressed with you. You look great. I think the motion picture is going to be a big hit. And uh, I wish you could stay with us, but you're going to...